Tommy, so congratulations. Thanks. And the Kenneth song was getting everywhere. Congratulations. <laughs> Uh, so now uh, they're going to be going far and wide. Um, I'm going to introduce, they, well, they work for creators from all over the world, just to be clear, it's not just people that they work yeah. that are in the area, so they work with everyone from all, everyone, everyone. Everyone. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, Payroll is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> crazy, so here we have uh, Chris Waddell, who is writer and editor in chief and co-publisher. Mm -hmm. And uh, Dominique Bercy, who is writer, artist, designer, and president slash publisher. Do you have that on a business card? Because that would be awesome. Uh, it might be. I'm not sure. Let's see. <laughs> <laughs> Take it out. There's a lot of stuff on this business card. There you go. You can get a business card to buy a comic book. <laughs> so, uh, I can sign it. Yeah. You first? Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah. Chris is going. I'm going to read um, Big Box Apocalypse. Uh, this is the third issue of how many? Uh, four. Four. So we're almost reaching the end. Now's a good time to collect them before they get, you know, sent and become something super uh, collectible and before they're worth a lot of money in eBay. So I'm going to read the log line. Is that okay with you? Sure. Yeah. Perfect. Because I loved it. Um, Teddy St. Louis owns a sh charming occult shop in an American small town that hosts the highest per capita supernatural population in the country. Business has been dwindling since Star Mart opened last year. Not only are regular folks shopping at Star Mart, but supernatural beings seem to be blindly drawn to the big box store and its burning neon star. Teddy discovers that the devilish Mona, Star Mart's owner, wishes to sacrifice the town's supernatural population and open a gate to hell. The end is nigh. The big box apocalypse approaches. Mm. And, and now um, Chris admitted that it might be a little bit hard. I can to try to do something though. Can you? Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, we can, so the floor is yours. Yeah, yeah, we can try to do something. So, Big Box Apocalypse, this is issue one of four. Now, it will be collected in a graphic novel later next year. And uh, it's featured in black and white, but it will be grayscale, so there'll be some textures added to the pages. And uh, it'll be collected in the graphic novel to be on Diamond distribution next year. Yay! So it'll be at comic shops everywhere. Yay! Yeah, technically. <laughs> so it opens with Teddy St. Louis. He's a man in his mid 60s. Bushy eyebrows, bushy mustache, white hair, old ball cap you'd see at a gas station. He sits at his stool uh, amidst uh, ceremonial masks, crystal balls, potions, herbs, whatnot. And then his narration begins. The dead don't shop here no more. The Black Cat Emporium has been open in Buffalo Falls since 1908. We don't just sell potions and crystals. We sell the kinds of goods and foods that folks who shop here at the Black Cat need. The kind you just can't buy anywhere until Star Mart opened last year. And then you see there's uh, items floating around the store. Uh, suddenly a $5 bill in a wallet appears and a science fiction magazine pops off the shelves. Teddy gets really angry and he points and he says, for God's sakes, Bill, can you put some clothes on? And then from the science fiction magazine you see, oh, come on, Teddy, it's a nice night, live a little. And then the magazine and the money get thrown on the counter. And Teddy continues, just because you're invisible doesn't mean you can go license, doesn't mean you got a license to prancing around town all indecent like. And then Bill says, lighten up, Teddy, take a step outside, get some fresh air. It's kind of stuffy in here, pal. Teddy goes outside and he looks into the sky. Full moon used to be our busiest night. Besides, folks like Bill, there's no customer loyalty. Maybe I had to let my favorite employee go, poor kid. Times have sure changed. The competition's tough. The prices are too low. The dead sure don't shop here no more. And Teddy lights a cigarette. Martha was always on my back to quit. God, I miss her. My smoking used to drive her crazy. I only smoke one or two a night. Eh? What's this? And then from coming down the street, we see a, a man all dressed up as if he's in a funeral parlor, but he's alive. Looks like some drunk that needs to sleep it off. Hold on, that, that's George McNutt. Poor George passed away a week ago. His wake is supposed to be tomorrow. Haven't seen a zombie in a long while. No one wants a zombie around. They're just too unpredictable. And then he puts a hand on George and says, okay, George, go on home to Zoe. I'm sure she's anxious to see you. George turns and walks down the street. That's it, George. Zoe will take good care of you. Then back to narration. Zoe and George McNutt, I should have seen this coming. Some witches have a hard time letting go. 
There's a reason why they have a code of conduct. Any spells used to manipulate, dominate, or control another person are forbidden. Can't say a blamer. George is a good guy. He was a decent man. Off to have a chat with Zoe. We all make mistakes. And that's about as far as you can go before you get really complicated. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty impressive. Yeah, that's right. Never heard of. Couple of couple of questions. Mm -hmm. um, do you have all three copies for sale in the dealer's room? Yes, we do. And how much are they? Five bucks each. Yeah. You'll be able to purchase all of these fine people's wares here after the book launch and also in the dealer's room afterwards. And uh, is there anything else that you'd like to add, Chris? Anything well, I, that you're... I think the goal of it was to create some sort of supernatural allegorical tale, you know, about, you know, big box stores opening up in small towns. But I wanted to do it in the sense of, like, say, Ghostbusters, like a horror comedy, right? Because I grew up watching, like, Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein and the Bowery Boys and things like that. And so I wanted to kind of, you know, reproduce that same kind of feeling in a comic book that, that would be, you know, both fun to read but uh, still have that sense of, um, you know, political statement or allegorical content that I thought would be important, especially considering the genre it's That's beautiful. Did you ever hear that? I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> that was wonderful. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for that. That was very lovely. Uh, so the fourth one is coming out when? November. November. And okay. then uh, we'll find out next year when everything will be out in Diamond. So That's exciting. Not sure yet. That's exciting. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. So we'll go to the uh, jump to the second release from uh, uh, my mirror comic. So Dominique Bessy has a copy of Ghost uh, King, and this is really fun. I got the press release. So I feel oh, like nice. I'm like, I'm, I'm medium prepared. Um, <laughs> so uh, this is fun. Uh, I'll read what this is about specifically, but um, your brother, uh, Nico, yeah. uh, he created a soundtrack and he has, uh, wait, don't tell me, I have it here. He is an experienced martial artist and a music producer. Yes. And he created uh, an emotional landscape by music, through music, that you can download, uh, purchase, with, uh, that goes with Ghost King. So that, that's, a, that's a fun collaboration to have so much talent in one family and to be able to put it to one project. That's a creative place. Yeah, that must have been a different experience, eh? Uh, I was kind of used to it. He did a soundtrack for my 24-hour comic. So I, I was like, do something, do something new. And uh, he, he came through guns blazing. And it was pretty amazing. And it's available on iTunes and a dozen other sites. But that's awesome. There's a QR code to lead you right to it in the new edition of Ghost King, which is what we're launching here. It actually launched originally as a digital three-parter on My Digital Comics in 2011, and then we went to print in 2012, and finally we have a nice square-bound edition back to its black and white roots, and uh, our new edition just got delivered this week, so we're launching it at CanCon. It's very lovely. Thank you for launching it here. Uh, may I read the back of the book? Yes. I enjoyed the back of the book very much. Cool. Um, I find copy is one of the, you know, I think that everyone here can agree, the back of the book copy is one of the hardest things to write because you have to try to capture so much essence in so few words. And well, I don't have an editor. <coughs> I, I wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> very well done. Very well done. <laughs> Well, I'm sure it catches the book very elegantly. <laughs> so, uh, I, I didn't know that, I swear. <laughs> so, uh, Ghost King, A Book of Changes, is a battle of opposites. East versus West. It's the right back copy, right? Because you sent that to me, dude. Oh, yeah, sure. Art back. versus music. Yeah. Black versus white, or ink versus paper, notes versus silence, good versus evil, tradition versus innovation, and sword versus magic. It is meant as a reflection on Chinese history. I see the back copy is beautiful. Chinese history in particular, and it is a testament to yin and yang dichotomies in general. However, it is not a historical account of any one particular event. Rather, it is a satirical fantasy horror story about a war that never actually happened. Set in ancient China and Cambodia, Ghost King pits the young warrior water dragging against his arch enemy, General Typhoon, whom he must bring to justice after the general and his army defect from the Middle Kingdom. That's beautiful. It's not the back off. Oh, he totally wrote that. <laughs> <laughs> Did you want to read the back off? I do. Do you mind? No, no. I feel like a... Yes, that's the one. Thank you. Okay. 
The Emperor calls upon a young warrior named Water Dragon to hunt down a defected general named Typhoon who has disappeared into the southern jungle. With the Emperor's swiftest horse on loan, Water Dragon quickly picks up the trail of destruction left behind by General Typhoon and his army. The closest Water Dragon gets to his bounty, the more he doubts his ability to kill the great General Typhoon, the mightiest of all warlords in Asia. Thank you. And I believe that you will be doing a reading. I uh, have the opportunity to do a reading because it starts with the narrator. And so I'll uh, do my best to do a reading. Um, like Caroline, this is my first ever public reading. Congratulations. So this is pretty exciting. Um, I feel like I'm in grade three again. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we'll, we'll see what you think of this. So it's called Ghost King, A Book of Changes. Family teaches you much, but not everything. My father taught me the art of war, the art of life I learned from my mother. I was a cherished son, but also a prized student. When they died, that which binds love in war I learned at the Temple of Changes. I am Chiang Lung, Water Dragon. I am a servant to a secret order of imperial warriors in the Middle Kingdom. I answer to the Emperor alone. My mission from the Emperor is the quest that follows. Many moons ago, I walked in the temple gardens at dawn. The water was peaceful, the lotus had sprouted from their bed of mud, and I knew that the kingdom was well. All was as it should be, and I smiled for the longevity of the great crane, our Emperor Divine. Then, without a sound, nor flutter nor squawk, black blackbird feathers fell against the red of sky and I knew that a message would come from heaven itself. Suddenly the garden rustled. I heard the approaching race of horse hooves. There, in the, there was an urgency in its speed, and once silenced, I was summoned from the temple gates. It was indeed a message from the emperor himself, a new mission for me alone, but with few details. I was to report to the palace at once. Tun Mi has defected, the, gen the emperor told me. Tun Mi, General Typhoon, I replied. His winds are wild that strike again, my lord. Do you believe me now, I asked the emperor. The emperor then relented. Young water dragon, I am sorry. I doubted you when you were a boy. Always true have you been to me, unlike the general's intentions. The son of heaven told me that rebels had been plaguing the southern borders, and so Tun Mi, General Typhoon, had been sent with his army to stop them, but never returned, nor sent word of victory or defeat, as is the imperial mandate. I shuddered. Tun Mi is the most feared of all warriors in the Middle Kingdom. What was he up to now? Before he left, the emperor confided in me, Tun Mi feared he would not return, for magic in the south is darkest over the Middle Kingdom. He bade me to entrust him not with one or two battalions, but his entire warring army, which I could not deny my best soldier. You will have an entire army as your enemy, Chen Lo. I now see, the emperor continued, that it was a ruse right under my nose to push far past the rebels and escape deep into the forests of the savages, never to return. Then the emperor said, take your perfect sword and my swiftest horse. Go south to the savage gates. Discover where my mightiest army hides lured by the wiles of General Tun Mi. When you find him, destroy him, and return to me my once trusted army, and as well as my finest of all horses. In this you must succeed. Tun Mi, his might was everywhere displayed. Thousands of men on foot and beast, wielding fire and iron and steel, had not only stopped the rebels at the border, they had crushed them. Tun Mi's own flailing strokes proved his personal bloodlust. He was not only a great leader and warrior, he was a destroyer. I replayed the scenes I found in my mind, how the battles were staged and played out. Tun Mi's men were not only obedient to him, they were by his might possessed. Everywhere that I found signs of carnage, few of his own men had fallen, but the rebels were not only felled, their spoils were strewn to posts in utter humiliation. This was a sign or warning to anyone who would follow the general's trail. Even by night, the emperor's horse drew strength from the universe to press on, and soon we picked up a fresh trail. 
smoke from a recent battle. Smoke led into the mountains, and I climbed the side of one to get a better view of the land. Atop the mountain, I climbed a tree and saw far ahead the course charted by destruction. We were getting closer. I raced down to the Emperor's trusted beast, almost tripping in excitement at the fresh trail. He was headed dead south. The Emperor's horse could feel a ru my rush of blood in excitement, and he raced forth through valleys and atop hills, riding smart to find the General's dreaded army. I found a village in ruins, trampled by fire and iron and steel, hoof and foot. Tunmi had been here. It was an eerie silence but for one thing. I turned back to witness a young girl humming by the corpse of a disemboweled villager, her eyes fixed on me. She had lost everything, and I could not help but feel compassion for her, yet more so I felt the haunting of her song. Before I left the scene, the hum on the girl's lips became a wailing scream of a song, a song forever etched in my soul. The faster I traveled, the thicker grew the smoke, leading me closer to the head of the dragon breathing all this fire, closer to General Tun Mi. Except for the rebels back at the border, I could scarcely believe that our enemies deserved such chaos upon them. It seemed desolate at first, but there were clues within. I found a special imperial coin which only the general could have carried. He was still alive. My shadow rove ab rose above the pools of blood, caking in the mid midday sun, and I sang a prayer for the fallen enemy. In fact, it was the song of the young girl from the village. As strong as we were, both my horse and I had enough, had had enough, and we became weary of this trail of death and decay. We were happy to leave these villages behind. What lay ahead were damp forests, and my horse lost speed with every step towards the darkened trees. I skipped a page. How about that? <laughs> we were happy to leave these villages behind. Let me wrap up here. Lucky for us, the villages and the mountains soon gave way to fresh hills and valleys. There was tall grass here and beautiful red flowers. The fields were stunning and refreshing, yet still their crimson color was too much the tone of blood, and we pressed on. I thought I had lost the trail when I discovered a sight I could scarcely imagine. The imperial horses had been stripped of their bridles and saddles, and were running free like wild creatures of ancient times, peaceful yet wary of what lay ahead. I was on the right path. First reading. Thank oh, you very much. Thank you. On that cheerful note, <laughs> 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 um, on the uh, fields of uh, past fields of uh, crimson, we go. And uh, I want to thank you all for, uh, first of all, for creating, for writing, and for being here to share that work. Uh, not every creator does that. Uh, not everybody is comfortable sharing their work in such a way. So I want to give you guys a big round of applause for that encouragement. <laughs> All of your items are for sale here today, uh, tonight. Uh, so come up, have a look. Uh, you can just come up and chat as well. There's no, uh, <laughs> there's no fear on that end. Uh, have some treats. Have some cola. We still have the room for about 45 minutes. So please enjoy the time. Uh, enjoy uh, the company and everything. They'll all be as well in the uh, dealer's room tomorrow. So if you're like me and you forget to uh, bring cash today because you're just not that cool, uh, you get it tomorrow. <laughs> but otherwise, get them tonight and encourage them for uh, taking this great uh, courageous step and throwing a beautiful book lodge. Thank you very much all for coming. Yes, you can get up and talk. Sure.